uh, we have an amazing guest speaker uh, in Justin Briarley, who I will introduce soon. Uh, and uh, at the end of the session, you will also hear from Steiger's founder, David Pierce, my dad. So uh, don't miss that. Mm. With me, once again, uh, I have, first of all, Luke Greenwood, Steiger's Hello, Europe. Hello, everybody. It's Luke here. I'm speaking slow for our translators. Slow down, they're saying. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so Luke is our European director. Luke and I have, he, he's in Poland. He's British, lived in Brazil. Uh, Luke and I have worked together for over 15 years now. I was just calculating earlier, Luke. Since, Since we were Luke little children. Since Luke was a wee lad. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, we first met, actually, uh, while on tour with the band No Longer Music in Brazil. And it's an awesome privilege to serve together, Luke, and, and hopefully yeah. many more. So welcome, Likewise. Luke. Likewise. I love being part of this. It's so exciting. It's been amazing two days, and I'm really excited about today. I really appreciate Justin and his work, so I'm looking forward to later on. Yes, yes. So, and also joining us is Lucas Ruger, a Swiss dude living in Beirut, <laughs> Lebanon. He is yeah. our, he, he's our Middle East director, and he has pioneered the work of Steiger reaching what we call globalized Middle East youth and incredible things. He will be actually a speaker at the last weekend, next weekend, um, and, and he has amazing things to say, and we'll, we'll learn more about that then. But welcome, Lucas. Thank you, and welcome, everyone. I'm excited as well to be here. My team here in Beirut, there, I think they listen to every single episode that Justin Briarly puts out on Unbelievable. Uh, we're a great fan of his work, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to be with you guys. I enjoyed the last two days, John Lennox, Paul Copen yesterday, and I think it's going to be very, very relevant what we're going to hear from Justin Briarly today. So, yeah, I'm excited. Hey, yeah, hey, Aaron, you know, uh, we've I don't think we've mentioned yet, but Lucas has this cool YouTube channel called oh, Deep Plate. Good. Yep. Lucas, Good. Will. yeah. And, and it's a will, secret when, for now, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> when true. he speaks, we'll definitely reference it then. But it, um, he Lucas has a YouTube channel, an apologetic YouTube channel called Deflate. I'm sure someone's putting it in the chat as we speak. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that will be that's a great resource. And we'll definitely reference that more um, when when Lucas is our speaker. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to remind everyone that the, the purpose of this event is to mobilize uh, followers of Jesus to for, for to mobilize you to reach young people who would not otherwise walk into a church. Uh, our, our mission, Steiger, uh, our primary purpose is, is to bridge the gap between the church and the global youth culture. Uh, and the way that we do that is by establishing Steiger City teams all over the world. And these city teams are specialists at reaching the global youth culture uh, through, through training and equipping the local church and engaging in creative evangelism, leading to discipleship relationships. And our, our heart and our desire is to see cities transformed, to see the church unified and mobilized to reach a generation that is often uninterested in coming to our church. So we've got to go to them. Um, I just wanted quickly, because there's been some questions, well, what is it that a Steiger City team does? So we're just gonna quickly run through that and then, and then we'll jump into our topic uh, for the day. So what is it that a Steiger City team actually does? Um, first of all, as you maybe heard in our, our values video that played right before this, but our heart is to base everything we do in, in a culture of seeking God. If you go to our international center in Germany, where we host, where the Steiger Mission School is hosted, you'll see on our wall written, God rewards those who seek him with a desperate heart. And this is from Hebrews 11.6. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a, a paraphrase. And it, it's just the idea that we want to seek God desperately and that nothing we do is going to matter if it doesn't come by God's power. And so we seek him desperately. Uh, the second thing that we do as a Steiger City team is we want to be relationally present in the scene. We want to go where people are and build real deep 
authentic relationships with people so that we really understand how they see the world and their fears and their hopes and their dreams so that we that God gives us a broken heart for them and we can communicate with relevance. So we want to be relationally present in the scene. And then we want to use that and engage in regular creative evangelism. You know, I love the arts and creativity, and I believe this is one of the ways in which God has made us in his image. And so we use creative things, tools, to spark gospel conversations that lead to discipleship relationships. And we do that in all kinds of creative ways. And then we want to host large-scale catalytic evangelistic events like concerts or online initiatives that proclaim the gospel from the rooftops. Because in a world that only hears lies, we want to communicate truth loudly for people to hear. And we do that in many different ways. And then we want to create discipleship relationships, foster discipleship relationships, whether it's through our Bible studies for the non-religious or our community houses. We want to foster discipleship relationship as a bridge to the local church because there often is a gap that we need to work through. And then we train the church. We love the church. We're part of the church. And we want to see the church equipped and mobilized to reach young people outside the church. And so we do all kinds of church training. And if you're a pastor or a church leader, we have resources and training for you that we want to offer. And then finally, we invest in young leaders and we wanna raise up the next generation of Christian leaders and influencers that can reach this generation. So this is, these are the main things that we do as a mission. Now I'm trying to exit out of my slide, which is struggling. For some reason I can't see my... Isaac, can you um, unshare my screen? What would we do without Isaac? Oh, seriously, there we go. All right, so this is a heart. And, and what we want to say to you is as you go through this time with us, if you feel called to be part of a Steiger City team somewhere around the world, then we want to encourage you to take the next step. And, and we're looking for people of all backgrounds and giftings and skills. Our teams are multi-gifted in that sense. And there's many ways that you can connect. Um, for example, um, this, this week we are going to have calls in all our regions. Where, and we want you to participate in these calls and learn how you can get involved in your city. And then also, uh, we in, if you're in Latin America, and we got a whole bunch of Latin American fire going on, um, this in the next month, we're going to be doing local Steiger intensive training in various cities throughout Latin America. So please learn, check those out and, and join us in person. And then finally, we have the uh, Steiger Mission School in Kiev, Ukraine happening in May and our full Steiger Mission School in Germany this summer, Lord willing, based on COVID. So these are the ways that you can get involved. We would love for you to do so. But today, just want to shift now. Today, we are talking about a very relevant topic for the global youth culture, the topic of who decides what is right and wrong. And to help us address this topic, we are honored to have Justin Brierly with us today. Justin, Ooh. thank you for being here. Justin is a writer, speaker based out of Surrey, I hope I'm saying that right, outside of London in the UK. Uh, he presents, right. prim <laughs> did I say it right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's good, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm, sorry, well, you know, I, well, you it's know, fine. I'm just it's a good. dumb American. Uh, he <laughs> presents Premier Christian Radio's flagship apologetic and theology debate program, Unbelievable where he brings Christians and non-Christians together for dialogue. He also hosts the Ask N.T. Wright Anything podcast with New Testament scholar Tom Wright. With these projects and others, he works to bring theology and apologetics into the real world, which is exactly why want, we want you here. So Justin, thank you so much. After all of that, thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, it's, it's an absolute pleasure and, and just so grateful for the invitation. Thank you very much. It's, it's so exciting as well to hear 
all that you guys are doing globally. I love the the way this is a, an absolutely international venture and you you just want everyone to join in wherever they are. I think it's it's fantastic. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, so the topic that we're bringing up today, this whole idea of morality and and understanding what is right and wrong is so relevant to the global youth culture. So if you don't mind, what I want to do is show a two minute clip uh, of a street interview to get us started and then and then have you react and we'll get going. Because what, what we find is when we talk to people on the streets about issues of morality and truth, there's a lot of confusion. And, and so I wanna show this video and then ask that you would react to it um, and to, to get us started on this whole topic of who decides what is right and wrong. All right, so let's, let's do this one more tab. How do you think we all got here? How did life begin? Um, it started with the Big Bang. <laughs> um, I don't really know much more than that. So I believe in evolution and that we evolved from primates. I mean, there's proof that our DNA is 98% the same as chimpanzees, so. <laughs> Probably just like a meteoroid with like some microbes on it that landed on Earth from a different planet and they were like eventually evolved to become humans. <laughs> what is the purpose of life? Oh my God. That's a Let me know when you figure it out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm still working on that one. Make your own. Like I don't think there's no like grand purpose for anybody. Just like and everyone is just, there is no purpose. Make, you, make up your own purpose and run with it. And, help continue the evolution of human beings as a species. So how do you think that right and wrong are decided? Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think it's different for like everyone, depending on like what they think is right and wrong. Cause like people believe in different things, so it can't be the same for everyone. That goes back to like your morals, I guess. It like because your right can be someone else's wrong, so it, it's all like based on your morality. I get, I, I take it. I think that like it depends on yourself and what you think is right and wrong and what you believe in, and as long as you stick to your beliefs and like carry out what the Bible says or what the Quran says or like whatever, then like you're living your life to the fullest, and that's all that matters. Uh, what do you think happens after we die? I don't know. I, I mean, isn't that kind of the beauty of it? You know, there's a lot of people who are spiritual and have things in which they believe in, and so it's kind of a manifest of what you, what you believe. I also feel like that is subjective because no one knows, and so I think that's kind of the beauty of it nothing happens and hopefully you lived your best life and if there is an afterlife hopefully I live within the boundaries and make it there you know what I mean so I believe in heaven I for sure believe in heaven um I don't know if I believe in hell I think that like if you want to believe in hell then you'll probably go to hell like rather than being showered with you know gold and jewels and we're living in some place where you have to have wings and a harp um, hopefully we just get reabsorbed into that consciousness that it allows the oceans to move and the tides and the rivers and the trees to grow and I hope. And maybe there's nothing. Either way, it doesn't matter. So there, there you have it. Justin, how, how do you react to that? Is that surprising or is that, yeah, what, how, how do you react? The, I, 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 not surprising in as much as those kinds of answers. I think, you know, I don't know where you shot that, but, but here in the UK, we would get a very similar range of responses to that. Um, it's it's very much a we're living in a generation which is kind of you've got your truth I've got mine uh, everyone's got to figure it out for themselves there's no set path we've all got to kind of make up our own purpose our own destiny um, and, and it's really interesting isn't it because uh, these are also the same people who might when, a, when an issue of justice comes up say no there is a definite right answer there is a definite way we should be treating this issue you know you look at you know, when people get out on the streets, to protest racism, if you're going to ask them, oh, so that's just what you believe, I could believe something different. I doubt they're going to say, no, no, you can, you believe what you want. I'll believe what I want. It's, it's funny. We live in a culture where there is this 
absolute contradiction at the heart of people. On the one hand, it's everyone just has to make their own mind up, do their thing, whatever works for them. And on the other hand, we're out there protesting, saying this is the way things should be. Things, you know, thing. And and I, I, I find it almost amusing in some ways that people don't see that they can answer in this way on some subjects. And suddenly when they're presented with something else, it's completely the opposite. There's a definite way we should be living our life. There's something we should all agree on. So I, I think we live in a very confused culture right now. Mm. I think I think that's the answer to it. Um, but we also live, and I loved this, you know, in, in the, the intro video before we started the session, we live in a culture where there's an enormous opportunity because right. actually people, young people especially, are passionate about justice. And I think it's helping them to see where that where that passion comes from why we care about the way life should be lived um that's that's the key thing for me yeah yeah it's it's interesting so i live in minneapolis so we were the the center of the universe for a few days back last year with the whole george floyd thing and i remember a few days after it happening coming and walking around the protests that were happening buildings still on fire and looking at all these people who were just passionate about justice, passionate for something that is definitively right. And it was just such an interesting point because these are the same people in this video that would say, well, morality is subjective. So it's that contradiction is so present. Uh, why do you think they don't recognize that? Or how do they live with that? I, I think a lot of it is, is down to the fact that we live in a very postmodern culture. So that, that essentially means, you know, we've we've lost the um, we've lost the big narratives that used to guide our life, if you like, you know, once upon a time, you know, the, the largely in large part, the West was a Judeo Christian sort of based nation. Um, and and in that sense, it had it had a pattern. It had a way of seeing itself. It saw itself within this big story of Christianity as that has gone away, as secularism has come in. What's happened is that basically we've been told repeatedly by our films by our media by our pop songs you do what works for you okay and and basically it says you got to be who you're going to be there's no there's no set pattern you've got to take do whatever feels right for you and essentially now everyone has to choose their own story their own narrative and this has led to this this general idea that actually no one really there's no overarching meaning there's no overarching purpose there's no right or wrong per se it's just you know you have your truth i have mine reference and yeah. and we'll kind of just we'll just jog along um and i think that's where it's coming from i think that's why people believe that but the problem is um i, I think they're only just starting to see now especially in a social media age that when another person has a very different idea of how life should be lived and it doesn't match up with mine but i feel strongly that no my the way i think life should be lived suddenly you get this butting and you basically get a culture war uh, which is what we're living through in a lot of our social media interactions right now hmm. and and hmm. so we, we we basically can't agree because we lost we lost the, the narrative we all once agreed on uh, and everyone's kind of basically doing their own thing and able to sort of be who they want to be but when but but when we find that that butts up against each other we we have a real tough time of it so yeah, it's it's an interesting one, but I think there is this extraordinary opportunity because actually, um, for me, the, the, this is one of the most powerful arguments for God, um, right. because you know lots of arguments, and we've we've done a lot of them on my show. You know, we're debating you know science and the universe and philosophy, and we're saying, you know, doesn't this all say suggest that there's a God, the the the, the sort of the order and everything <laughs> in the world. But when, when it comes to this, when it comes to the way you feel about something, the, you know, the issue of racism, for instance, when I, you know, if you say it's wrong, it's evil to, to discriminate against someone based on the color of their skin, you're, something, you're saying something very interesting. You're saying there's something about this universe that isn't contained in the molecules or the physics of it there's something actually embedded in reality hmm. about the way we should treat each other. Okay. Something and absolute me, almost. Yeah. It's there's, there's, there's this, you know, to use the, the, the big grand philosophical terms, there's this objective reality about nature. And that is that there's a certain way humans should treat each other. Hmm. Now, where does that come from? 
because that's the question I want to ask the person who believes so passionately in justice and in anti-racism or whatever. I want to say, where does that come from? Where did you get that if you don't believe in God? I think there's an extraordinary argument here. It's one of the most powerful arguments, in my opinion, for God, that the world is not just composed of atoms and electrons. There's actually this moral reality and we're all living in it and we all feel it at certain times. You know, if you're you, you could be a relativist who says, I, I think people, you know, believe what they want. They, you know, some people believe this, other people believe that it's all up for grabs. But if someone comes up to you in the street, punches you and takes your wallet, you're going to stop being a relativist pretty quickly <laughs> at that point. You're going to exactly. see, I've just been, you know, the, the sense of justice rises up in us, you know. Mm. And when we see people out on the streets demonstrating, we can see that there is this sense of justice that people have. And the question is, where did that come from? It, mm. Is it just an, a, an accidental byproduct of a kind of purposeless process of evolution? That doesn't make sense because that's not the way we think about it. It's it's something much deeper than that. Well, and well, I think that, that's pointing beyond us to something else. Sorry. That's right. Well, you know, Justin, that was one thing I was going to ask you next was relating to, to what you just said, because one of the most common counter arguments to that 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 comes up in some of your debates on the unbelievable podcast and also when we go to the streets doing what aaron showed on the videos all around the world and as you pointed out it's the same everywhere very similar responses very often a counter argument that comes up is well we know what's right and wrong from experience from time from history man mankind humankind has learned what does good for our community what does bad so they it's an evolutionist argument and it says we we don't need a god or a religion to tell us what's morally right and wrong we've learned by common sense by repetition by experience we've learned what's right and wrong so how, what what have you seen as some of the best ways to respond to that well i guess one of the easiest ways to respond to that is is simply to point people to the fact that evidently despite our evolutionary history we still uh, live in cultures that are very different and which we disagree with the way they're living okay so if if basically all of our beliefs our moral beliefs about what's right and wrong are just a kind of happy accident of the way evolution has produced some kind of societies that that sort of function better when they're agreeing on on how to do things well what what do you say to a culture, for instance, in some parts of the world today, where female genital mutilation happens, okay? Um, now, in the West, most people would say, that's wrong, that's evil, you should not be doing that to young girls, okay? But if you believe that actually, hey, we're all just kind of jogging along with whatever our evolutionary history happens to have given us, well, that's just the way things turned out in that part of the world, mm. okay? That's, mm. you know, you don't have any right to criticize them because that's just the way their culture gets on with things, okay? But most of us realize mm. that can't be true. It's either mm. right or wrong, okay? Either women shouldn't be subjected to female genital mutilation or it's okay. And so there's a problem. It, it, just saying, oh, it's just whatever evolution mm. handed to us doesn't make sense because mm. there are some things <laughs> That we still believe are wrong even though that we're at this particular point in in you know you go back 200 years okay the fact that most people in north america were fine with slavery well does that mean it was fine well no it doesn't they were wrong about it okay they were mistaken mm. so it doesn't really matter what evolution happens to have given you the question is is it right is it wrong that means there's a there's a, a, a value beyond evolution there's something mm -hmm. else by which we believe we're, we're measuring this there's an ultimate standard and whether or not your evolutionary history happens to have delivered you the right one well that's the big question isn't it because we obviously don't believe it always does mm -hmm. uh, so for me it's always pointing beyond ourselves the, the, these feelings we have of justice these this idea that there are really right and wrong ways to treat people in the world that they're, they're all saying actually there's a standard that, that exists outside of ourselves, outside of the natural order. It's already there and we're heading, we're either heading towards it or we're heading away from it. But who put it there? <laughs> that's the mm -hmm. question. And for me, that's where you have to go beyond the natural. You have to say there's a supernatural dimension to life and it's, and it's God ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I would add to that, Justin, I like what you said. And I would add to that. This is maybe a bit complex, but it could, you could actually, for the sake of argument, 
give in and say, well, we might have learned about our objective morals through the process of evolution, but that does nothing to, you know, do away with objective morality because, you know, we learned, you know, 300 years ago, 400 years ago, we didn't know all the objective facts about the universe that we know now. And yet that doesn't know that those objective facts were real and that there was an objective reality about the physical universe. So in this sense, you know, the way we come to know about something has nothing to do with the mm. objective reality of the thing itself. You can learn about the, I mean, about the law of gravity through a fortune cookie or by reading a textbook from university. It just doesn't matter how you learn about it. it the law of gravity is objectively true, whether you know, no, no matter how you yeah. learn about it. Yeah. And yeah. What's, and what, what's interesting for me in all of this is that um, I think people have forgotten actually where this sense of the rightness and wrongness of things kind of has come from in a sense, because it, it's not as though um, th there's a sense in which partly it seems to be somehow inbuilt in us. We get this mm -hmm. sense of fairness, justice. If someone does something that, that hurts us, we can kind of emphasize and understand why it's wrong then for us to do something that hurts someone else. But at the same time, it, we in the West, especially that there, there has been this Christian tradition and it has shaped the way we think in ways that people just don't realize today. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my friends who are humanists, who, you know, maybe they're atheists and they say, hey, we just we, we just um, it's just obvious, isn't it, that humans should treat each other with equality, dignity, human value. And, and I would say to them, it's not at all obvious, actually, if you look at history, if you look mm -hmm. at other parts of the world, that is not the way cultures have run. It's mm -hmm. a very particular way that our culture has run for the last 2000 years since Christianity began. And, and so I think it's really important to point people back towards the fact that if you like things like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was mm -hmm. signed about 70 years ago, uh, if you think that's a great foundation for how we should treat each other, it didn't just come out of thin air. It came because it was the end result of a long period of Christian history where people worked out this is the best way to treat each other. And it's on the basis of something right from page one of the Bible, which is that all of us are made in the image of God. And that gives us all ultimate value, ultimate dignity. And in cultures where they haven't had that belief, you won't find that kind of view of people. People are disposable. There are some people who are at the bottom of the pile. And if you happen to work your way to the top, then, hey, that's just the way the gods have blessed you. OK, but in Christianity, there's this very unique idea of the intrinsic dignity and value of every single person. And if you've got a friend who says, I don't need Christianity, I don't need religion. I just believe in the value of human beings. You've still got to ask, where did you get that belief from? Mm -hmm. It didn't just pop out of thin air. It's because you've been raised in a Christian culture or a, a culture that owes its values to Christianity, even if it's now moving into this post-Christian period. And, and that, I think, is so important to, to, to help remind people that the, these beliefs you have in justice, equality, human dignity, human value, they're kind of fragile. They might not necessarily stick around if we abandon Christianity. Uh, and as we start to develop our own narratives, our own ways of being and everything else, then we're going to realize, actually, these things might go away if we're not very careful. Mm -hmm. It reminds me, Justin, you've, I think, in, yeah, in your book, you mentioned a conversation you had with Richard Dawkins and you, I think that's, this is exactly the theme you chose to talk to him about in the, in the 10 minutes or so you had with him. And you asked him whether it was okay that morality was arbitrary, like, like you were just describing and whether, I think you said something like if, if we think rape is wrong, is that as arbitrary as us having yeah. five fingers instead of six? And, and he said, yes. And why is well, I mean, you've already uh, said, can, it, can I quote it? Can I, can I quote it? Because I've got it yeah, right go here. It. And, and I yeah. thought I'd just have it ready because it is very relevant. Um, so, so this is this is the book I wrote, Unbelievable. And it's, it's kind of my case for faith. But yeah, this is going back about 10 years or more. And I had an opportunity to do a kind of very quick discussion debate with Richard Dawkins. He's for those who don't know, he's one of the most well known atheists in the world. He wrote this book mm. called The God Delusion that, you know, has, has gone around the world. Um, anyway, he did um, uh, a great debate in Oxford with John Lennox, who you had on, on the conference just two days ago. And uh, they were debating God in the Natural History Museum in Oxford. And at the after show party, I managed to, to 
get a quick interview with Richard Dawkins, where we talked about this very issue. Like you say, Luke, it was this sort of question of, did we just evolve our morality, you know, and we just happened to have got what we got? Or is there something beyond us? Is there something that actually, is there a standard that, that lives outside of ourselves? And this, this is exactly how our conversation went. So I said to him, but if we'd evolved into a society where rape was considered fine, would that mean that rape is fine? And he said, well, I don't want to answer that question. I'm doing my best <laughs> Richard Dawkins impression here. Okay. That's very good. Yeah. I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> it's enough for me to say that we live in a society where it's not considered fine. We live in a society where selfishness, failure to pay your debts, failure to reciprocate favours is regarded askance. That is the society in which we live. And I'm very glad that's a value judgment. Glad that I live in such a society. So I said, but when you make a value judgment, don't you yourself immediately step outside of this evolutionary process and say that the reason this is good is that it's good and you don't have any way to stand on that statement. And he replied, well, my value judgment itself could come from my evolutionary past. And I said, so therefore, it's just as random in a sense as any product of evolution. He said, you could say that in any case, nothing about it makes it any more probable that there's anything supernatural. To which I said, OK, but ultimately, your belief that rape is wrong is as arbitrary as the fact we've developed five fingers rather than six. And he said, you could say that. Yes. Hmm. And you could say that. And I think actually you should say that if you're a thoroughgoing atheist, if you're a naturalist like Richard Dawkins, our morality is just kind of the happenstance of what evolution happens to have dealt us at this moment. OK. But none of us actually believe that we be none of us actually live our lives like that. We actually right. believe there's rape really is wrong. OK, we, we, we that that's a you know, non-negotiable, if you know what I mean. Mm. And so we've got to ask ourselves, well, then it's not just evolution. OK, there's something beyond it. And, and I thought that was a good example of a, of a conversation mm. that does that. Yeah, ju just really brief about that. You know, there is I mean, on again, on evolution or against the background of evolution, rape is I mean, we consider rape to be wrong. Just it's n it's arbitrarily so. However, there is actually a good book I like to quote to atheists who, again, base, you know, refer back to evolution for morality. There is a book called A Natural History of Rape. It's written by a biologist and an anthropologist, both atheists, and they say that on an evolutionary perspective, it actually makes sense for males, for human males, to rape females in certain situations because it, if it's all about passing on your genes, then if you're a male who can't get, you know, uh, like to like to pass on your genes through consensual sex, well, then you might force yourself on a female. So actually, so these are two atheists who are saying, well, evolution would actually tell us that rape is is a good thing in certain circumstances. And then the rest of the book, they wrestle with this question, but well, we we don't quite agree with that. So how how yeah. do we deal with that tension? You know, and and, so. and this is the point is that mm. a lot of people think these days that well science has the answers. You know, oh, that's right. You want to know what to do? Science will tell you. Okay, <laughs> that's that's kind of been the mantra of a lot of the, the the atheists. But that's the point. Science is neutral. Okay, science can yep. tell you what happens under certain circumstances. It'll tell you, you know, what will happen if you split the atom. Okay. But it doesn't tell you what you should necessarily do with that. OK, and likewise, the evolutionary story, it, it'll it say, well, this is happening here and that's happening there. None of it's telling you how you should live your life. OK, that's a decision we make. And it's it's something that we have to go somewhere else to make those mm -hmm. kinds of decisions. You know, science is great for what it can explain about the natural world. OK, no problem with that. But when it comes to morality, purpose, identity, it's not got a lot to tell you. And that's where we need something else. And for me, that was obviously um, comes through Christianity. It comes through the person of Jesus Christ, specifically the identity he gives us and the purpose and the, the, the example of his life, which for me is if, if we could bring our world back to seeing the way that that is the best vision for life, it could be transformative uh, because people are so confused now. They don't know what to believe. They don't know who they're supposed to be. They don't know what their identity is anymore because they've been given so many options and actually Jesus Christ is waiting there to give them the answer again for a generation that's that's hopelessly lost on that front mm -hmm. and, and that's exactly where we'd want to get to also especially in this conversation is how can we show this other you know this this good and true side of morality as we see it in God but there's a challenge in this because often 
morality is a very common thing that comes up in conversations with non-Christians. And it seems like even more recently, this has really turned <coughs> where, whereas maybe some time ago, the church was seen as having moral authority. Now, a lot of people look at the church as immoral and, and they say that they're haters. They, they hate the LGBTQ community. They, um, they're arrogant in their exclusive beliefs. And it's, it's a strange time for us as followers of Jesus before we might have been trying to defend the intellectual aspect of the faith. And it feels like today the biggest front is this one that we're talking about. It's this mm. m- uh, moral front. How can we show the morality that we find in God? How can we respond well when society around us is making this accusation that the church is immoral, that we, we don't mm. have a moral authority mm. anymore? Mm. It's a huge question. Um, And it's one where I think, firstly, we need to hold our hands up and admit when we have got it wrong. And obviously, the church is, in a sense, a human institution. It's it's made up of humans. And so it's going to get things wrong. And we've got to be honest and and hold our hands up when we do get it wrong. There have been so many times down history when the church has been wrong about things, when we have not shown the love of Christ, we've not represented christ in the way we should and it still happens today so there, there are lots of instances where i could happily say to my secular atheist friend who's criticizing the church yeah i agree with you the church didn't get that right um but the other thing the thing i would simply say to that person is don't judge christianity just on the behavior of its worst adherents okay it, it ultimately is about jesus I, and i promise not to judge atheists on the behavior of their worst <laughs> members <laughs> either okay But the point is that the only way people are going to hear our message in the first place is if we actually look like Jesus. And and Jesus told us that himself. Okay, Um, you know, when they see the love you have, that's when they'll know that you're my disciples. It's not actually by our clever arguments or our brilliantly put together doctrine. The first thing people are going to be looking at is do they look like they love each other? Do they look like they're a kind of community I'd want to be part of? And so that mm. that has to be the starting point. And wherever we fail to represent Jesus in the way we act, uh, the tone, the grace, um, the love that we exhibit, and that doesn't mean we we dial down, you know, what we believe about life and about the way it should be lived. But it's the way that often it's put across that obviously puts people off. So I think that's the first thing is to say, mm. I understand why people would say, you know, the church has no moral authority when you look at some of the things it's done. Mm. Having said that, though, I would also want to help those people say see that I'd ask, well, where where is the moral authority these days? Then who who does get to decide what is right and wrong? Mm-hmm. Um, because it's very difficult to see where that is coming from at all um, in today's age, and it's almost like for me some of the modern ideologies um, they've become quite uh, religious in nature themselves. Actually, there's almost a puritanical streak, you know, to, 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 mm-hmm. in some degrees, you know, when you go on twitter and certain sort of cliques of people there there's this kind of righteous anger that comes out if you know people go against the things that they believe that you know if you're cancelled or it's like being cast out because you're a heretic you know it it, there's this kind of religious nature actually Mm -hmm. and so the problem is in my view is that when people get rid of one form of religion they just replace it with another we're we're inherently religious okay we Mm -hmm. we have to have a kind of Uh, things that we gather around ideas ideologies Uh, there has to be real right and wrong because that's the way we make sense of life okay and the problem is if you if you say well the church isn't it anymore you're only going to replace it with something else and what people i think are finding is that those things don't actually ultimately help in the end either because we can't agree as i said earlier on on what the right way of looking at life is so so i think um the church has to definitely hold its hands up but also to say okay we want don't look at us look at jesus okay for some reason i think for all the bad that the church is known for for all the the, the you know the things we've got wrong and the, the polls tell us you know people don't re- regard the church as having some moral voice it's interesting that nonetheless people still have this respect for jesus that hasn't that doesn't seem to have gone away people still believe that jesus is somehow an example of good living righteousness mm-hmm. and so on and I think that's a testament to the power of the person of Jesus in the Gospels, that, that it's very hard to deny just how good Jesus is when you read the Gospels. And for me, that's who we need to be pointing people back towards, not to yeah. the church per se, 
but to you know the person behind it all jesus christ that's great that's great one kind of taken in a slightly different way now um i there's there's kind of the atheistic um debate around morality um and and a lot of people in the global youth culture are not atheist um in fact they're they're still believe in some kind of vague spirituality and and actually what i've seen a lot is a lot of people are influenced kind of by eastern religious thought and that that how that affects their morality which allows for a more relativistic universalistic view of morality have you experienced that or how do you see that playing into this whole equation i, I think you're absolutely right um not that many people i meet are necessarily hard and fast atheists okay now my show tends to deal more with people who who are very kind of strictly naturalistic deterministic you know atheist types but actually, the average person on the street probably wouldn't go that far. And they would say something like, yeah, I just believe there's a kind of maybe there's some kind of life force. You know, there's yeah. something. And that idea has been around for ages, actually. In fact, if you go and read Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis has this wonderful um, section in Mere Christianity where he talks about, you know, the average person these days likes to think that there's some kind of life force in the universe. They won't give it the name God, but they will say there's there's something there and and he, he talks about the fact people are very happy to sort of ride on the crest of this life force when it suits them, you know. Right. But he said, the thing about this life force is, it's the reason people like it is because it doesn't make any demands on your life. Exactly. He says, so, <laughs> so if you want to do something a bit shabby, he says, suddenly, well, the life force doesn't care because, you know, the life force is just a sort of import personal force. You know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna tell me that I'm doing anything right or wrong at hmm. this point. Um, and and he, he says, he, he ends it by saying something like, um, is the life force the, the greatest um, invention of wishful thinking the world has ever seen, basically? It's, it's this idea that we like to have this tame version of God, where it gives us the nice feels and it gives us a sense that, well, there's something beyond me, but it doesn't make any demands on me. That's the main thing. And I think um, whenever you've got that, you've got um, a sort of toothless, tame god of our own creation and that's what a lot of people i think have ultimately um and what i love about lewis is he says the really interesting thing begins when you realize there's a god who is not tame on the other end um and a god who makes demands on your life because uh, that is when you start to realize that actually it's not about you it's not about your personal preferences it, it, God, God cares about the way you're living your life, who you're going to be, and what direction you're going in. And for me, um, it's it, that's part of the culture. It's part of helping people understand we live in this me-centered culture, and it, and we even create God in our own image in that way. It's just the kind of the thing that helps me get through life, and uh, you know. But actually, God's God's much bigger than that. God cares about mm. the way you live. God care. God, God has a demand on your life, and that's scary. But actually, it's the best possible thing you can do is put yourselves in the hands of that God. Um, so yeah, that's that's the challenge. How do we how do we introduce people to the God who is a living God, who, you know, who's not a who's not a tame lion, you know, as C.S. Mm. Lewis would say, he's a he's a living, mm. fearful, but yes. ultimately loving God. Yeah, mm. good. I think it's about framing <clears throat> morality in a in a positive vision for that, <clears throat> rather than seeing it as kind of a restrictive kind of thing that prevents your freedom and your fun. It's a positive vision of morality, and a lot of the the people that I interact with, especially those that have kind of Eastern religious um, influences, it's about saying, well, actually, if I'm just kind of a random evolutionary product and i believe in some vague power but really it's i get to decide that's actually a scary place because there's no anchor or source that i can go to that says this is good for you and and i guess to me it's it's about seeing the morality of of jesus in a it framing it in a way that is positive and and good rather than restrictive and, and punishing I, I don't know that's that's been helpful for me in in this kind of dialogue how, how do you frame mm. positive morality more in a in a vision like that as opposed to kind of the maybe the religious view that people have yeah i, I think you're dead right I, and i think the problem is many people even when you say the word christian christ church they have a preconceived notion and for a lot of them it still is that idea of this place you go where you basically get preached at 
and told all the things you're doing wrong and all the things you should be doing. OK. And, and sadly, that that is you know, the image of church and Christianity that a lot of people have imbibed either subconsciously or maybe they've had a bad example of Christianity mm. growing up in that way. Um, yeah. I mean, ultimately, it's only going to change when people in actually meet an, another Christian, someone who is actually looks like Christ, feels like Christ, talks like Christ. So that's down to each one of us. OK. And it's about us us being the people. And and I the, the one thing in my show that makes the big difference. OK. If, if ever someone makes a move from kind of a secular atheism towards faith, it, it's very rarely just on the basis of a great intellectual argument. OK, now that has its place. OK, the arguments are important. But it's the example as well of the individual. Uh, mm -hmm. It makes so much difference when people's preconceptions are broken down. OK, it's because a lot of people come on my show with a particular conception of the kind of Christian they're going to meet. And if that person actually, you know, blasts those conceptions apart, suddenly they're opened up to the possibility that there may be something in this after all. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, that that's that's what it's got to be. It's about us living uh, a life that isn't about look at all these rules I have to obey. It's about look at this freedom I have. Look yes. at this extraordinary. And I think part of that is helping people to see that you're not any more, you're, you think you're free, but you're not free, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's what I loved about the intro video as well. People mm -hmm. are absolutely bound down by things in the culture today. They may not realize it, but they are. They're, they're, they're people. So many people that I meet are basically kind of, in chains over social media, the way they have to present themselves, the way they have to speak and act and, you know, the kind of persona that they have to be. <clears throat> um, they're, they're often privately bound by addictions, whether it be a kind of that kind of social media addiction, a porn addiction, whatever. There's so many ways in which actually people who think they're free are not free. Mm -hmm. And there's that phrase, isn't there, in Christianity that true freedom is service. And it's, it's actually by submitting ourselves to Jesus that we find true freedom. That's the paradox of Christianity. Mm -hmm. You you will never meet someone who is more free than someone whose life is fully submitted to Jesus Christ. And mm -hmm. that's that's and and but we need to people to see that 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 is not yeah. some kind of prison sentence, some death sentence. It is a death sentence because it's kind of saying I'm going to die to all of that stuff. But it's freedom mm -hmm. on the other side. And and that the only way people get a taste of that is if they see it coming out in our lives. And that's that's the big challenge. Yeah. Yes, you know, speaking about great minds gradually investigating Jesus and, and we, we often watch and hope and pray for people that we see doing that. And you've had very interesting guests on your show. One of them in the early days when he was starting to grow in popularity was Jordan Peterson. Mm. And there was an interview that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but I'd love to show a short clip. And it relates to morality because Jordan Peterson is a non-Christian um, psychiatrist, thinker, who's uh, most of our listeners have probably heard of. But he really seems to be thinking and asking questions that relate to religion, spirituality, God. Uh, he did some talks on the Bible. Um, and this particular moment really got me going, wow, something is going on there. And he mentions morality as an important reference for him to think about God. And uh, Aaron, if you could show that, and now I'd love to hear your thoughts, Justin, after. Sure. Hmm. So, okay, so you can think about Christ from a psychological perspective, and the, the, criti the critic, my critic, this particular critic that I've been reading, said, well, that, that doesn't differentiate Christ much from a whole sequence of dying and resurrecting mythological gods. And of course, people have made that claim in comparative religion. Joseph Campbell did that, and Jung to a lesser degree, I would say, but Campbell did that. But the difference, and C.S. Lewis pointed this out as well, the difference between those mythological gods and Christ was that there's a, there's a representation of there's a historical representation of his of of his existence as well. Now you can debate whether or not that's genuine. You can debate about whether or not he actually lived and whether there's credible objective evidence for that, but it doesn't matter in some sense because this well it does, but 
there's a sense in which it doesn't matter because there's still a historical story. And so what you have in the figure of Christ is an actual person who actually lived plus a myth and in some sense, Christ is the union of those two things. The problem is, is I probably believe that, but I don't okay. know. I don't, I'm amazed at my own belief and I don't <laughs> understand it. Like, because I've seen... Sometimes the objective world and the narrative world touch you know, that's Jungian synchronicity. Yeah. And I've seen that many times in my own life. And so in some sense, I believe it's undeniable. You know, we have a narrative sense of the world. For me, that's been the world of morality. That's the world that tells us how to act. It's real. Like, we treat it like it's real. It's not the objective world. But the narrative and the objective world touch. And the ultimate example of that, in principle, is supposed to be Christ. But I don't know what to, and that seems to me oddly plausible. Yeah. Well, but I still don't know what to make of it. It's too, it, partly because it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it. Mm. Wow. Powerful moment, yeah, wasn't it? I, it was. And I have watched the interview in full. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm in talks with Jonathan Padjo, who's his, uh, discussion partner coming on the show actually to talk a little right. bit about it and, and about oh, his wow. um his his own thoughts as well um, he's orthodox right that's um, right he's a he's a carver of orthodox icons jonathan pajo and uh so so he's got a you know and, and i think they've been friends for some time even before before peterson kind of went stratospheric as it were with his his, his <laughs> uh, recognizability but but the um it's just an amazing it is an amazing clip and, and I've I've been really interested myself in in Jordan Peterson's journey, and um, I had him on my show uh, about three years ago now uh, from this first season of what we call the Big Conversation. It's a special sort of video discussion series from Unbelievable, and he was really playing the role of the Christian in that debate, opposite an atheist, uh, basically arguing for the fact that we we need the concept of God to make sense of life. I mean, that was his ultimate point, and 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 I think that's a point he makes frequently elsewhere. The, the the interesting thing is he hasn't quite reconciled himself yet to the idea of God as a living, breathing, not just that life force we talked about earlier, but but a God who has a claim on his life. And and he sees the extraordinary attraction of Jesus Christ. And he sees the way that, as he says, Christ brings the objective and the narrative together. There's this kind of this objective fact about a person called Jesus Christ who lived in history. And then there's this kind of vision of Christ, which is this kind of absolute you know who what we call the son of god the the one in whom everything exists and to whom everything is owed and, and who gives us the, the the vision for what life should be and he sees that in 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 jesus these kind of two things meet and that that has been the way in which so many people have understood life and and he finds himself strangely drawn towards that mm. that great mystery but he doesn't know if he can commit himself to it and 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 it's because as he said in the end of that it's it's just almost terrifying. Yeah. And I just, mm. I, I see Peterson as one of those people for whom they, they get it. They really get it, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More sometimes than a lot of Christians get it, if I'm honest. Yes, right. Because he recognizes, if this is true, it changes everything, okay? Right. And, and we need to recognize that too. Because sometimes we actually forget that, okay? We, we tend to live our life without recognizing just what a difference it makes if you, the God of the universe has actually stepped into time and history, and I believe I am in a relationship through that. And, and so for me, it's, it's incredibly exciting uh, to see Peterson on this journey. Um, and I think we'll all cheer if, if and when he kind of crosses that line, whatever that looks like. But for mm -hmm. me, that maybe the more important thing is that he's, he's opening up this conversation to all kinds of interesting people who wouldn't normally wouldn't give Christianity, a, you know, a second glance. Yes. But actually, they're hearing it from someone they respect, uh, someone who's gone on a crazy journey over the last year anyway himself, mm -hmm. and who actually mm -hmm. doesn't just deal with it on a purely philosophical, intellectual level. But you can see from that video the way it personally impacts his, you know, it matters whether this is true or not. Right. And for me, that's, that's, that's really exciting. And Justin, the thing that really caught my attention in relation to this conversation, you said it yourself earlier in our conversation, 
that the conversation around morality is probably one of the strongest points in which people can realize God or be, in, be you know, have to see God yeah. revealing himself through, through that. And it seems like that's one of the key points for Jordan mm. Peterson, because yeah. he says that a place where he sees what he calls that narrative perspective with the objective world coming together in morality. And that was, mm. uh, you know, at some points in our conversation, you were saying, you know, morality is that thing that y it's objective and it's also there's intrinsic value. There's a God given mm. value to it. And mm. uh, it's almost like it seems like that's one area of life that is speaking to him. And yeah. it just made me think that how important this issue is, this topic um, in, in our conversations with people. When we go out, when we share our faith with our friends um, in, in our mission work that we do with Steiger, how important it is that we know how to help people see the character of God and why our sense of justice and morality, like you said, um, really points to that and how, how helpful it can be for people to realize that and uh, find God through that, too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I think this is it. It's it's got to be both and. We need to sort of have, you know, it's important we have that intellectual understanding. Yes. So that when when we meet the person who says, oh, but you know, we can all just believe what we want and, and we'll get on fine. You can say to that person, why do you believe that? Where's the evidence for that? You, you've got to have that sort of intellectual side to say, where, where does this belief you have in justice and the value of human beings, where, where does that reside? But we also have to have that other side of it, which is, um, do I look like I care about that? Actually, does it make mm -hmm. a difference to me? It, is the way I'm interacting with this person, is it something they would want to embrace? Because ultimately, mm -hmm. that's that's why people came to Jesus. It's because he was so attractive to them, the way yeah. he lived his life. Um, and then when they listened to him, he had the words of life as well. He had the truth as well. So so it's, it's bringing those together, the intellectual mm -hmm. truth and and the witness that we that we have. That's good. Um, mm. Justin, what we're going to do right now, um, we're going to take a short break. Um, we're going to start to compile questions from the audience. Um, and um, we want to just give the audience a, a chance to ask some questions. There's been a bunch coming through. Um, so we'll take this break. Also, when we get back, Justin, I'd love for you to share about uh, your conference and other things that you've got coming up that our audience can benefit from. So we'll allow you to speak to that as well. And then we'll have some time of question and answer before wrapping it up. So this has been awesome. And uh, guys, throw in your questions. We'll pull them together. And after the break, we'll, we'll bring them to Justin. So let's go to break. All right, we're back. All right, so we got some questions rolling in. Throw Justin on the screen too, since he's the one that has to answer <laughs> Yeah, we kind of need go. Justin. <laughs> All right. Hey, Justin, by the way, that was just awesome session with yeah, you. Thank you for right. your wisdom and your answers is so good. So good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, before we get into the question, Justin, would you just share a little bit about uh, um, the conference, Unbelievable Conference and other resources that you yeah. have for our people? Yeah, sure. Sure. I'm going to I'm just going to screen share a few things. Um, first of all, we, we talked about him earlier, but here he is, Jordan Peterson, and uh, he's opposite Susan Blackmore in that photo. This is from our big conversation she series. She looks angry or upset or something, there, Justin. <laughs> she, she looks very frustrated at that point, and uh, and Jordan Peterson has a wry smile. It's a great episode <laughs> if you get a chance to to go and uh, to go and watch it. Um, but basically, the big conversation is is a, uh, a series where we bring some of the biggest intellectuals together to debate some of the biggest questions in life. So um, if you want um, more about it, I'll I'll share a link in the chat. Um, we're just going to be starting season three um, on the 2nd of April, Good Friday, in fact. Uh, and we've got we're, we're starting with a, a fantastic discussion between um, a well-known atheist YouTuber, um, Cosmic Skeptic, um, opposite uh, one of the leading kind of Christian intellectuals in the YouTube sphere, um, Bishop Robert Barron. So um, they're going to be debating Christianity and atheism, which makes best sense of us. So so do do follow uh, the big conversation, uh, the big conversation dot show is the place to, to go uh, if you want to find out more. I'll just I'll pop that in the chat now. Yep, there um, it is. But we're, 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 we're really looking forward as well to um, Unbelievable, the conference, which is taking place on Saturday, the 15th of May. Um, and again, I'm just going to, if I may, uh, share my screen. Uh, and uh, Tom Wright is an amazing um, 
uh, thinker. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see that the, the the poster there. It's kind of got a Star Wars vibe going on. And force be with you. Absolutely. Um, anyway, uh, N.T. Wright um, is one of the, the most preeminent theologians in the world. He's an extraordinary um, uh, scholar, New Testament historian. He's going to be joining us for the day, along with um, the guy at the bottom there looking to screen uh, is Tom, Tom Holland. Holland. Um, and he's just got the most amazing story. Um, he's, he's a really interesting historian who currently um, is just on a very interesting kind of similar Peterson-esque journey, really, towards Christianity. Um, and he's he will tell in the conference about the way he came to realize that amorality, what we consider valuable in the West, all stems from the Christian story. That's been wow. really the, the work of the last several years for him. Uh, we've got mm. some other great contributors, uh, Sean and Josh McDowell, both wonderful uh, apologists. Um, Claire Williams from the UK from Get Real uh, is going to be talking about urban apologetics. Uh, myself and Ruth Jackson will be hosting the conference. So if you want to join us uh, for that, we'd love to see you there. Unbelievable.live is the place to book in, to register for Saturday the 15th of May. We're kind of doing it um, in the afternoon hour time so that people in the US especially can join us, but uh, you can get hold of all the sessions afterwards as well. Uh, so, so go and check that out. Um, I won't, uh, I won't share the video I have um, of, of Tom Wright personally inviting you, but uh, that's, that's there on the <laughs> website if you go and, if you go and watch that. And yeah, doing kind of what you're doing here, guys, um, really about helping people to engage the culture, helping people to, especially in a COVID age, um, look at some of those big questions around how do we meaningfully engage people? And as the conference title suggests, how to tell the greatest story ever told. People mm. don't, people have kind of forgotten the story that shaped them, the, the story that gave a meaning and narrative to their life. And I think the challenge for Christians today is to just tell that story again to today's generation and make them realize that life really doesn't mean anything without this story of Jesus Christ at the center of it. So, so that's what we'll be aiming to do. So good. So good. And if I could mm -hmm. say from, because a lot of the <clears throat> people here today are, are connected in some way to Steiger city teams around the world. And, and we have a kind of a philosophy in our mission of, of, of bringing together, oh, got some, oh, yeah. uh, bringing together some tensions around what we call the head, heart and feet. And, and the idea of the head is that we want to be culturally relevant, understand people biblically sound and really know how to answer the tough questions, which is what this event and your event are all about equipping people to do. And then we wanna combine that with the heart, which for us means complete dependence on the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit moving through us, seeking God desperately, that we don't wanna just have our head, we also want the heart. And then finally yeah. the feet, that we put that into action with boldness and courage and taking risks and not waiting for everything to be perfect. And our view is if you combine all three, it's dynamite. And so we love resources like yours, whether it's your podcast or this event, because it helps our people grow in their ability to connect at the head level with the global youth culture. So very mm. grateful for your mm. resources. And we will definitely be pushing our people that way. Um, mm. To get into the questions, I have a very important question to start. See, I'm kind of a big deal on TikTok. <laughs> and I noticed, I noticed that you keep showing up on my for you page. So how did you get it? Is this what, what are you doing with TikTok? You know, what's the so, goal there? Well, this is all really down to my 16 year old son, Noah, um, who is <laughs> the, the TikTok master really in our house. Uh, he's been on TikTok for over a year now, I would say. And he's got his own kind of niche. He kind of does kind of um, money making entrepreneurial tips for teenagers, basically. Uh, and um, so he, he'd kind of established this and uh, and he was saying to me, oh, dad, you, you should put some of your, you know, apologetic stuff on TikTok. I think there's a place for that. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll get around to it one day. Well, anyway, finally got around to it um, over the Christmas break. Uh, we said, OK, let's do this. And I, I shot a couple of videos and yeah, it kind of took off uh, surprisingly. In fact, the, the, I think it was the second or third video I, I made <laughs> um, suddenly like went viral uh, as far as these things do it's now on like six million views on tiktok it's uh, it was basically just a response to someone who because i had done a couple of arguments kind of classic philosophical arguments for the existence of god and uh, and someone said yeah but um uh, if if god created everything who created god you know classic question so i did this kind of analogy with building blocks and and that just yep. seemed to catch people's attention and and so 
uh, I found myself going, you know, my, my number of followers increasing. And so I felt like, oh, well, I should probably put some more videos out now. <laughs> um, so I did some more. I've done a few apologetic sort of 60 second thoughts on things like suffering and evidence for the resurrection and other things. Uh, so, yeah, it's been exciting. Um, and I think I'm on about just over 200,000 followers now, which is great. Still way behind my son, who who is now on five hundred thousand followers. So you know, he, I'm 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 in here. You know, he's he's way ahead of me on TikTok. But but no, it's it's exciting. It's it's kind of um, it, the technology moves so fast, doesn't it? And it's and you, young people. I, I feel old saying young people, but um, they it, it's it's like following where people are actually looking is is yeah. so critical if we're going to do mission. And I'm not saying I'm at all the best person at doing this. But you realize actually it's not necessarily that hard. You've got a decent little bit of kit, you've got a camera, you've got an interesting idea. It works. You know, it, I didn't have to kind of spend, you know, a year researching this. I just thought of something, yeah. put it on. And uh, hey, if, if people like it, they, they watch it, That's they share great. it. So, uh, so yeah, it's exciting. And, and TikTok's a unique platform because it, it has that ability for more people to go viral. Um, and for in the way that it works is an interesting it's created the middle class of creators as they say whereas mm -hmm. YouTube is more just a select elite so yeah. it's great it was good to see you there and it's keep keep up the good work so thank you <laughs> it's just about I, time though to be honest I, I just I, I, I always struggle with just finding the time to kind of sit down and come up right. with you know a 60 second script and, and and put something out there but it's it's great when when people do see it and and respond mm -hmm. to it yeah mm -hmm. Justin, I want to pick up on something you mentioned before the break, which is, you know, uh, when it comes to life force and God and, and morality, you know, morality, I guess, more than any other topic that is discussed in apologetics uh, is, you know, it, it, it really gets to our hearts and it matters to us emotionally and not just on an intellectual level. And um, I think here what I realize is that it's very important to see you know, those arguments or those discussions in the right, in the bigger picture life, in the sense, like also spiritually in the following sense. You know, I had once a girl talking to me. She was from a Muslim background and then, you know, became agnostic, new age, Eastern religions and stuff. And she, and then she started a journey towards Christ. She had like a bit of, you know, supernatural stuff happening to her, Christ appearing to her. And she said, you know, Lucas, I, there was a point in my life, I, I knew that Christ, Christ is the real deal. I was absolutely convinced, he, like he is it. But I didn't want to embrace him because I knew I would have to change my life. And she specifically said, and I guess that's, you know, that's oftentimes what people mean when they, when they say about changing their lives. She said, well, I knew I'd, I'd have to change how I live out my sexuality. It, it would just not be anymore that anything goes. And I didn't like it. And that's why it took me much longer, even after I realized uh, that Christ is the truth, to actually submit to him. And so I want to encourage all of us, you know, again, to see those discussions in the right light, that ultimately people are in rebellion against God. You know, that's the state that the Bible describes uh, the human condition how the Bible describes the human condition. And so it's when we, when people put up those arguments, they, sometimes they are real, you know, or they, they, they put up those questions. They really have struggles and they honestly wrestle with those intellectual issues. But sometimes it's just that, you know, they actually know the answers, but they don't want to go through with the consequences. And so it's, you know, we, I think as, as we have these hard conversations, we really need to, you know, ask God to help us to, you know, to discern mm. where are mm. people really at? Where is their mm. mind at? And where is their heart at? And to, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you handle it? How you, even with your conversation partners on your, on your show, you know, how do you, you know, try and look beyond the, the, mm. the, the, the intellectual arguments? Yeah. Yeah. And the intellectual arguments, I agree, Lucas, can often kind of be a smokescreen ultimately yeah. sometimes for for what is ultimately a heart issue um and i've always said you know I, I don't think ultimately you can argue someone on purely intellectual grounds into the kingdom now i'm not saying that they aren't important sometimes it's for me the value of apologetics is often removing particular objections that maybe stand in the way of someone mm -hmm. walking down the road towards jesus but they kind of have to want jesus at the end of the road you know you can't mm -hmm. force someone to want jesus uh and if someone ultimately, if their heart 
is stopping them. You know, is that if that's the ultimate blockage, I can't mm. do anything about that in a way only right. Jesus can, you know, and that's for me why prayer is the forgotten element so often. Apologists love their arguments, but they don't spend nearly enough time just praying for the people that they're mm. arguing with, you know, and this is this is the key. Um, it's a spiritual battle as much mm. as it is an intellectual battle or whatever. And we've got to to pray. We've got to trust that God is moving and ask mm -hmm. the spirit to come in and to break down barriers and, and just for people's hearts and eyes and minds to be open, you know, because yeah. ultimately, as you say, it's much more than intellectual arguments in, in the end. That's right. <clears throat> Justin, I'll bring a question from one of our audience related to that. Uh, it's Dirk Beigent from Austria, who's faithfully translating into German right now. Wow. Um, he asks, have you ever experienced a conversion from an atheist speaker? Isn't that very hard because he or she loses um, their platform or maybe the way he makes a living? Mm. Yeah, I, I think I think that's true. I, I think it's especially where someone is a kind of quote unquote celebrity atheist. Uh, maybe they're, they're well known in that sphere. I, I think it's, it's, it's hard for them to then potentially you know, take seriously or completely objectively evaluate the evidence. Uh, but that's true for all of us in a way, you know, I'm a Christian, I run a Christian ministry, you know, mm. I can accept that atheists are going to say the same thing about me. Um, yeah. I'm kind of invested in it in a way. But we all come to everything with our own perspective, our own biases. We just have to recognize that none of us are neutral on these things. Mm. Uh, but we, but what I try to do on my show, especially is, is to, 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 to genuinely try and Put the issues on the table and genuinely give them a fair airing and and hear what people on both sides have to say uh, ultimately yes uh, there's a lot more going on under the surface for whether someone will ultimately choose to believe as as lucas was just saying it, it there is a matter of the heart going on there's going to be all kinds of other issues psychological spiritual emotional mm -hmm. the history of this person all of it will will ultimately make up who that person is, apart from their their intellectual objections or whatever, and and so you kind of have to leave that in God's hands and 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 commit it to God. Do what we can do faithfully, but say ultimately, yeah. And yes, there are people who who have crossed the line. Um, uh, more with the show, especially, it's never like one one hour conversation changes someone's mind. It tends to be part of a bigger story, a bigger picture. But yeah, I, I'm I'm so grateful to know people who some people who have been on the show who changed their mind, who became Christians later on. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wow. But everyone's on on a on a journey of some kind. You know, there are other people who were going in the other direction, and and you know, ultimately, I don't. It's not my responsibility in a way exactly what people do with with the conversation that's had. I kind of have to say, I'll do my best, Lord, to. Put the right people together have to have a good conversation but ultimately it's then it's down to it's between them and you ultimately what they make of that and, and which direction mm -hmm. they go in you know true yeah. good mm -hmm. um i have another question from nadia uh, she says i have a friend who is sure that there is a higher force in the universe and that there is morality uh, but she refuses to accept that it is god uh, what argument can be more effective for her so how do we engage someone from that perspective sure. it's it's interesting because i suppose she probably has then some view of what god is um and i think you'd want to ask her, well what do you mean by god you know um you don't believe there's a god but you believe there's a higher force and there's this moral reality to the universe well it sounds like she's part of the way there you know she's got part of the picture and and i'd want to hear from her well what, what's 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 the god that you don't believe in let's, let's just start with that and maybe you'll find actually, well, I don't really believe in that God either, because maybe they've got some idea of a sort of God who's standing ready to punish anyone who steps out of line. And, and there's a sort of there's a pictures of God, you know, that people have. And sometimes you first of all have to dismantle the faulty picture of God before you can start talking people into a kind of what a true picture of God might look like. And for me, very often the wrong place to start is to sort of say, well, let's think of God as this, uh, the immutable characteristics of God, his omnipotence, his divine benevolence, his uh, omnipresence. You know, none of that really, from the average person, helps them picture God. It just makes God this unknowable, you know, Theology. abstract thing. Yeah. The point of Christianity is that God became knowable in a person, Jesus Christ. And so the first mm. person I would say, if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Okay. 
and that's the starting point for me because it, that gives something tangible for people to focus on and say what if god was somehow represented uniquely in this person jesus christ let's look at that to start with so that may be the point to start with if you're struggling to get your friend to kind of even kind of get an image of what god is like in a way mm. Yeah, that's great. Justin, I want to pick up a question from Oscar Garcia from the audience. And uh, he asks, how can I justify to a skeptic that morality comes from God? You know, I guess before the break, we were talking about why atheism or evolution cannot give us morality, even though we feel like it's objective. But how do we move on to actually make a positive case for God or maybe even for the Christian God specifically with morality as backdrop? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I, I think so if we've established that this person believes there is a kind of a real moral realm, you know, an objective mm -hmm. moral realm that, that we aren't just floating in a sea of uh, relativism and that some things really are right and wrong, then the question of, of how do we know that God is responsible for this moral realm? Um, I think that's quite, quite difficult in a way, because in a way um, it's about saying, if you like, we can show that, that naturalistic atheism doesn't deliver us this this realm of objective moral values and duties mm -hmm. and the question is well how then do we show positively that the christian god is the source of these objective moral values and duties um in a way for me that would be about simply saying you recognize that these things exist you kind of you see them you feel them okay um is there a source what if it's if it what, what could that source be now on a philosophical level you could you know, people can be what's called Platonists, you know, they can believe that there's some kind of additional realm that exists. Okay. But I, I, for me, I find it very hard to see how this, if there's just this kind of realm, like a mathematical realm or something, you know, mm -hmm. of objective values and duties, how it makes any difference to me, you know, why should I follow these particular sets, these, these laws that are somehow written into reality, still don't kind of personally impact me. The only way that that makes sense of the fact I feel I really should act this way, that it's really wrong to treat people in other ways, is if there's a kind of personal aspect to this, if there's a personality in whom this morality exists. And mm -hmm. for me, it makes sense to say that is the Christian God, because from its inception, Christianity has said that God is love, for instance. That is a kind of a core idea that the, the, the very one of those important aspects of morality, love, is God is defined by that characteristic, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and, and in that sense, I think you just have to say, morality isn't this kind of abstract impersonal force, okay, that we can kind of choose to obey or not. It's, it comes to us, it makes demands of us, it's personal, and that means its source has to be personal. And the only way I can see to make sense of that is that that is God, that is God. And, and in the sense, if you wanna make it even less abstract, Again, I would point them towards Jesus Christ, who says, I am mm -hmm. the way, the truth, the life. What you, the way you act, who you are, the way you identify, it all somehow finds its ultimate purpose and reason in me. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's, that's maybe the, you know, the direction I would point someone in. Yeah, that's great. And I want to kind of pick up because you said, you know, God is love. Um, and we talked about this before, that it's very important for people to see that God is love in the way we live our lives. I had, we had in our Bible study for skeptics, there was a, there was a, a guy, a young guy, a software engineer who came from a, like quite a radical Muslim family and he joined our Bible study. And then he, he, like after a year or so, he said, hey, Lucas, you know, you guys kept, you kept repeating or telling us that God is love and I could never make sense of it. It just wouldn't make any sense to me. And then he said, well, then I saw, people joining our group or this, this Bible study, which I thought they are very hard to love. And then I saw how you guys treated these. And he, he literally said, that's when it, these people, he said, well, I saw how you guys treated these people with love and respect. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's when it clicked. I just understood what you guys meant when you, when you say that God is love, because I saw it in, in action. So again, I think, you know, we, we can make, give explanations and try to explain to people who God is, but they need, they really need to see it. That's what mm -hmm. Jesus himself tells us. Yeah. yeah. Well, we are a combination of the head and the heart, aren't we? That's right. And we can believe things with our head, 
but we don't really believe them until we accept them with That's our heart. Right. We, we, mm. we, and, and for me, apologetics has to be both. If it's That's one right. or the other, if it's just the head, it becomes dry. It, it becomes the kind of thing you can kind of compartmentalize and put away. If it's That's all about right. the heart, it doesn't respond to people's genuine intellectual questions. When you bring them together, it's very, very powerful. That's right. So, yeah. Yes. There's another question here that I think is almost like the next step from what we were talking about, recognizing God and, and uh, morality. Uh, Henrik Mach from uh, Prague wrote this. How can we help guide people through the benefits of repentance and changing to a godly lifestyle? So when somebody already recognizes there is a God, I do want to know him. But then there's that moment of repentance, which I, I think it's a good question. It's exactly the question of morality, right and wrong. How do I mm. change the lifestyle? So he's asking, how, mm. how would you guide somebody through that understanding? And, and it's, it's a huge question because that will all depend on the person, on their history, uh, so much, you know. And, and this is where, um, you know, discipleship is is what it's about um there, there's we can you know it's wonderful to bring people to a point where they can recognize their need for jesus and where they want to take that step but the actual repentance and transformation is a lifelong process you know for most people that doesn't happen just overnight now there are miraculous stories aren't there of people whose you know drug addiction vanished overnight when they became a christian or, or whatever but those i think are actually rare i think most of us even lifelong christians we still struggle with mm. that transformational aspect of life constantly dying to ourselves and being raised with christ is and i can only do that in all honesty in a community in with other people who i'm on the journey with so the first thing anyone who is thinking of making that decision and wants to do that they ha they can't do it by themselves you know jesus gave us each other he gave us the church because we're a community who encourages each other uh, lifts each other up when we fall over um, and 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 I, I would say that that so it's it's got to be about helping someone to be be part of a genuine Christian community where they can go on yeah. that journey of transformation and repentance mm -hmm. and accepting we will fall on our face face a lot of the time. People who have lived a certain lifestyle and it's become ingrained and habitual and whatever and there's all kinds of hard questions around what they do and don't do now. There's going to be lots of grey areas and difficulty, but mm -hmm. ultimately being in community with other Christians and, and and being willing to sort of have the grace that is needed to allow people to go on that journey and not get it right all the time but but kind of to, to learn and to grow that's essential and and I think that's where we need to extend as much grace and hope to people and and just encourage them alongside them as as they start to to look at their life and and what needs to change about it that's mm. so good and it relates a lot as well to what we do in the mission, we've um, often talked about discipleship um, using the term discipleship relationship, trying to emphasize exactly what you just said. It's that discipleship isn't just getting the right ideas in my head or going to a program where I'll finish the content and I'll know how to be a follower of Jesus. It is that relationship in community that you just described and mm. i think that it's all the more relevant to the audience that we're thinking of throughout this event which is the you know young guys and girls around us who are coming from a background of no church often never having read the bible and many of them coming from a relativistic background and we tried addressing that throughout our conversation today how what does morality look like from the relativistic um, perspective it's interesting, similar to Lucas, uh, I've had a few different opportunities of having Bible studies with people who have never read the Bible before. And I remember once um, we were having a Bible study with, with some guys in Germany and they were we, we were reading a passage about sin and repentance, this question that Henrik just asked. And we were talking about it and I realized that what they were when they were talking about sin, they had a different perspective than what I meant when I said sin. So I asked them, what, what do you guys understand as sin? And they put it like this. They said, well, sin is the stuff I do that doesn't do me any good. And so we each have to decide what is sin for us. Because if it doesn't do me good, then I will know and I, I have to decide. And 
so I, I realized, wow, you know, it takes time often for somebody to change their perspective on understanding the difference between that relativistic way of seeing the world and a biblical perspective that, as you were just saying, um, morality is based on a person. And, and he decides what's good and what's right for me. And sometimes I might recognize it as bad for me. And other times I don't realize I need yeah. him to show me. And it's understanding the lordship of Jesus. So this process is so important. I, and it's good you mm. were talking about yeah. the importance of relationship and community for that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Um, I've got, we're going to do one more question. It's been a, an engaging conversation. Thank you, Justin. Um, we could go on forever, of course. Um, the question, there's two questions. One's from uh, Michael. Um, I can't say the last name, so I won't try. And um, Angelo um, from Brazil. And they're both around basically the definition of love and how when you say God is love, similar to what Luke was just saying, how what you say and what is received is not always you know, understood the same way we think. So if, if the concept of love is so critical, obviously, to who God is and evangelism. How do we? How do we? Under, how do we clarify what love really means in light of kind of a, an evangelistic approach that might just say God is love or God loves you, the end, or yeah. you know, it's it's yeah. So how do you? How do we respond to something like that? Yeah, and and again, so often people come with their own concepts, don't they? that have to kind of be broke understood and broken down sometimes just like you were saying luke you know someone has this particular definition of sin which is basically whatever i think is is you know harming me rather than maybe there is some real objective sense but love equally can be can be misunderstood you know a, a lot of people when they hear the phrase god is love they're going to think oh well god's just some kindly old grandpa in the sky who kind of looks down at me and says oh it'll all be okay you know it doesn't matter what you do you know um, and actually, no, that's that's not really what love is, actually. Um, love, what love looks like in the Bible is a man being crucified and um, giving his, you know, it's it's quite shocking, actually, sometimes what love looks like. And um, and for, for me, that's that's the really important thing is actually getting people to realize that love is costly. Love is sacrificial. Um, mm -hmm. Love is not just these fleeting feelings you have, you know, where you can start with this partner and when you've decided you don't love them anymore you move on to the next person love is love is more than that love is a choice love is uh, a commitment love is a challenge you know um and and we've so we've, we've got to kind of help people to, to put away these kind of very vague false notions of love and see this real rich deep <clears throat> form of love i mean the first place you could point people towards is that fabulous passage in first corinthians 13 where it talks about the nature of love and says love is you know and it lists kind uh bears all things suffers all things you know we've got this amazing description of what love is and that actually god is the embodiment of all of that and i think the first thing to do is to recognize that none of us actually experience love in the world in that way we right. we all like to think that we experience love and we give love but we give this very pale version of love and we receive it's it's like and love humanly experienced always lets us down you know the people we love the most also hurt us the most most of the time and so when people are coming to us well what is this god of love that you, that you believe in you've got to tell them uh it's it's not the kind of love that you may have experienced in your life which is conditional and is basically you know reciprocal in some way it's a it's a love that is pure pure extravagant sacrificial pure grace and is there for you but it will demand so much of you as well because it's a love that won't want to see you stay the way you are it's a love that wants you to be with him it's a love that will 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 challenge you to the core of who you are um so i think it, it's 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 both you know it's saying it's it's bigger than you can imagine but it's it's more exciting than you can imagine. It's more challenging than you can imagine, but it's worth it. It's worth it. You, why settle for something less when you can have the real thing, when you can, can have mm -hmm. God? Um, so yeah, that's maybe where I go with that one. It's awesome. Awesome. Justin, thank you so much. It's been an honor to have this conversation with you. Again, I want to encourage everyone to check out 
you know, go to unbelievable.live to learn more about the conference, check out the unbelievable podcast and the books and other resources that you have. It's uh, your great encouragement to us and, and, and mm -hmm. very important part of the kingdom of God. So thank you for your contribution and thank you for being part of this. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's That's been right. an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on guys. All right. We look forward Let to having you on our podcast again, Justin, sometime soon. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be fun. Fun to fun to be with you again. Organized chaos. <laughs> That's, right. smoke and inspire. <laughs> That's how we do it. <laughs> All right. We'll uh we'll let Justin go. Um, and again, guys, such a, a great and relevant conversation. I think the whole challenge of morality and relativism is so relevant <laughs> to reaching <laughs> the global youth culture. What do you guys you, give me your summary thoughts and then we'll we'll transition. Yeah, I, I, I was really impacted by um, realizing how important this particular question is for, for people today and, and for people realizing who God is. Because I think I've often seen it as a difficult question and how do I answer it well? And today's reminded me, actually, this is kind of a key way God is revealing himself. He reveals mm. himself through our realization of of right and wrong, of morality in our own lives. And mm -hmm. seeing Jordan Peterson starting to recognize that more impacted me. And Justin confirmed that in a few times in our conversation. This is an important thing to talk about. It's a way that God can reveal himself to people today. So that's so cool. Yeah, that, that's right. I agree, Luke. And I also think that, um, you know, the, the challenge here is that people, like we're, when we're dealing with morality, we're dealing something that people just take for granted. You know, no one ever thinks, why do I think that racism is wrong? No one ever thinks, you know, why do I think that rape is wrong and that true love is the real deal? They just, you know, we just, we just do it. And so I've experienced, you know, that it takes people a long time, you know, and you really have to challenge people with, with, with basic steps and go slowly to, to help them realize, well, you know, there must be a source for why we think that, you know, there are things that are right and things that are wrong. And I think, so I want to encourage all of us, you know, we, you know, let's be patient with the people we're trying to reach and let's, yeah. uh, you know, recognize that God is at work, even if, you know, even if we may not see it directly, God, I mean, Jordan Peterson is such a great example. And uh, yeah, I mean, God is at work in his life, obviously, and that's that's the case. Yeah. And, you know, one other thing, Aaron, that I think is cool for us to learn and apply in <laughs> what we do is um, I forgot to ask him about this. But when Justin started the Unbelievable podcast, he's on a Christian radio, Premier Christian Radio mm -hmm. in the UK. It's um, the Christian radio in the UK. And he says he described it like this, that he realized that everything they did was good content for Christians. And he, he went to the producer and he said, can I have one moment in the week where we actually talk to non-Christians and, and, and have conversations with them? And that is so much the heart of what we're trying to communicate as a mission, isn't it? It's like, how can we, you know, when we talk about bands and artists, we're like, it's great to do good music and art for Christians. But can we have something that really engages with the non-Christian audience? And that can be applied in everything we do. That's at the heart. We want to know how can we be close to those that wouldn't walk into a church today? How can we communicate clearly to them? So I appreciate Justin's heart in that. And I think it's something mm -hmm. we can also learn more from as a mission. Great. That's great. Well, um, don't go anywhere because in a few minutes here, we're going to bring on David, the founder uh, of Steiger, because, <clears throat> you know, the key in all of this is we don't want just good head knowledge and conversation. We want to apply this. And we want to um, use what God is teaching us here in, in the world. So in, in a minute, I'm going to bring on David. Quick couple of things to remind you. Um, the, the next step in connecting with our teams is the regional call. There are going to be a number of regional calls for Europe, Brazil, Middle East, Russian-speaking world, North America, Latin America, and Asia Pacific. Uh, all of these are going to have a regional call that we would like you to be part of to learn how you can be part of this mission. Um, so make sure you connect. There's an image that was just put in the chat that shows when and uh, how to get onto it. You will also get an email from the people in your region about this. So get connected. Let's not just talk about this. Let's do something about it. 
Um, we have many training opportunities available. The Steiger Mission School, the Steiger Intensive Tour, go to our website, check those out, but get involved, take a step. Um, that's what this whole mission is about. We, get, we do something together that we couldn't do apart. So um, with that, I'm gonna let Lucas and Luke go and invite my dad to jump on here, wherever he is. So let's see how this works. Hey, hey how are you doing? Hey, Pops. Can you hear me? I can hear you. So take it from here, Dad. What do you wanna to say to us? Well, first of all, I thought I can't do this without uh, bringing on one of, one of uh, our, our artists from, from Brazil. So moi, are you there? Hello, everybody. Yeah, I can't see you. Can you see me now? I'm yeah, here. So, so I asked Moi, you know, this has been an amazing first weekend, hasn't it? Yes, it's been amazing. So I thought Moi should read the countries of the people that have been involved in this first weekend. So we have Argentina, Australia, Austria, Belarus, Brazil, Bulgaria, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Croatia, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Denmark, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, Estonia, Finland, France, Ghana, Germany, Guatemala, Honduras, Hong Kong, Hungary, India, Indonesia, Italy, Jamaica, One Love, Japan, Jordan, Kazakhstan, Latvia, Lebanon, Lithuania, Mexico, Moldova, Netherlands, New Zealand, Nicaragua, Nigeria, Norway, Pakistan, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, Philippines, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Russia, Santo Man Principe, Saudi Arabia, Serbia, Singapore, Slovakia, South Africa, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Tanzania, Turkey, Ukraine, United Arab Emirates, United Kingdom, United States, Uzbekistan, Uruguay, Venezuela. Woo! Woohoo! Hey, come on. We together, together we will change the world. You know, when I saw uh, the video of Jordan Peterson and he's struggling with what if Jesus rose from the dead? You know, what if Jesus really was was a real man who came and who died and rose from the dead? It was like a, like he was afraid of this idea. And the fact of the matter is he has risen from the dead. And all of you from all over the world who have joined us have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead inside of you. In Ephesians 1.18, it says the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to us. So even in a pandemic, when there's political and economic crisis, our most fruitful days are ahead. And I know, you know, many of us right now feel weak. We feel overwhelmed. But the, the point is this, Jesus' kingdom is like a mustard seed. Jesus said that a man took a seed, a, a tiny speck. It's like you could hardly see it. And he put it in the garden. And it grew up. And it became a large tree that the birds of the sky lodged in its branches. Great moves of God always look small, unremarkable, foolish even. And the good news is that God's power is glorified in weak people like us. When I was living in Amsterdam, one day I was looking out our apartment and there was a riot going on in the street. People were, were uh, digging up bricks and, and they're throwing them at each other. You're, you could hear glasses breaking and one gang was chasing another gang down the alley and then the other gang would pick up bricks and chase the other gang down the alley. And I'm watching this out my window. All of a sudden, one policeman came and he came driving into the parking lot. He jumped out of the police car and he started running into the gangs, about a hundred people armed with just a rubber stick. And when he did this, it was amazing what happened. People threw their bricks, threw their bottles down, and together they ran down the alley with the policemen chasing after them. And I thought, this is crazy. But you see, the policeman believed in whom he represented. For that moment, 
He believed that the authority that he had as the police was so strong that he alone could run into a riot full of people with, with bricks and bottles armed only with a rubber stick. It's time, it's time for us all over the world to believe in whom we represent. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? He who is in us is greater than he was in the world. And now is the time for us to have radical faith. At our center in Germany, we have a big sign on the wall. And it's, it says, God rewards those who seek him with a desperate heart. It's based on Hebrews 11:6, where it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God, for you must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who seek him with an earnest heart. God is always moved with desperate prayers, always, 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 and now more than ever, now is the time for all of us who follow Jesus to say enough is enough. It's time that we say we are not going to accept the status quo anymore. Jesus says to you, in this world, you will have trouble, but be courageous. I have overcome the world. I was on, I was, um, on tour with my band, No Longer Music, in Turkey, and I went to Ephesus. And I went to the ancient ruins of Ephesus, and I wanted to read about Paul, the Apostle Paul in the Bible, what it was like when he was in Ephesus. And so I, I read that, that God did great miracles through Paul, that people would take parts of his clothes. You know, they would take, they would take parts of his clothes and they, they would cut it off and they would go and they'd touch people who were sick and they'd be healed. And I'm, I'm reading this in the, in the ruins of Ephesus. And I felt like God spoke to me and said, David, Paul wasn't some guy floating in the air. He wasn't some supernatural being. He was somebody just like you. I want to do things like this in your life. If you will seek me desperately, if you will follow me 100%. You see, we are in the beginnings of a new move. In every revolution, that has begun, has begun on the streets. And a Jesus movement, it, Jesus movement is already beginning. I'm here to tell you, from Moscow to Sao Paulo, from Buenos Aires to Berlin, from Beirut to Houston, from Delhi to Seoul, from Hong Kong to Cape Town, and everywhere in between, a wave is coming and nothing is going to stop it. Nothing is going to stop it. Jesus takes away our guilt and shame, our sorrows and fears, and he fills us with joy and courage. And then he gives us a mission to complete while we are still on this planet. The purpose of your life is not pleasure and pointless consumption, not to be constantly searching for security and comfort, the world wants to turn us into zombies, void of all human feelings and passions. But when I receive God's calling, when I hear God's voice, I become ignited with life and purpose. And it's not a, it's not a wide road. It's a narrow road, costly, but it's the best. Take a look at this map. This is us. This is the location of all of our countries, all of us who have participated just during this first weekend. Look at that. I mean, it's crazy to think that all of us have been brought together from all over the world for just this first weekend. All movements of God always start with a few. All movements of God always start with a few. Just like us. Sparks in a dry field. Parched 
and lifeless, embers of light, so fragile, they could go out at any moment. But when God breathes on us, these embers turn into a raging fire that nothing will put out. And I'm here to tell you right now, God is breathing on us. God is breathing on us. Do you feel his breath? He calls us. He calls us to go to a global youth culture, crying out for hope, looking for answers. God is saying to all of us, all of us scattered around the world, he's saying to us, stand up. Receive your calling. Say yes to Jesus. Say, here am I. Send me. And so I want everyone now to turn on your video. Okay, everyone turn on your video. And just kind of scroll and take a look at each other. I, so if everyone who can, if you could turn on your video so we can see you. If everyone could turn on your video and just, just scroll on and see everyone there. And I'd like us together around the world to raise our hands. Together, raise our hands before God, together, and say, Jesus, here we are, your children, scattered all over the world. And we raise our hands together, and we say, Jesus, don't call someone else, call us. We are weak but you are strong and you have always used weak people like us to change the world. And so we are ready. Take this spark that's in us, blow on it with your Holy Spirit and let it be a blaze that consumes our lives and let us be a light to this world that needs to know the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you. Guys, God's moving. Make sure you're connecting. Make sure you take steps. God is moving and it's so exciting to be part of this. Remember, we're going to be back next weekend. Friday, Saturday, Sunday again, we're going to be talking about justice, we're going to talk about sexuality, and then we're going to talk about how do we apply this with real people. So don't miss it. Share it with others. We love you all. Have a great week. Talk to you soon.